Ladies and gentlemen, this is a warning. Thank you. From the American Broadcasting Company's Bicentennial Center in New York City, Harry Reasoner. Good morning. We're here and we'll be here throughout the day in this red, white, and blue studio to take a look at what the second oldest major continuing nation in the world is doing to celebrate the 200th anniversary of its independence. Operation Sail is just beginning under the Verrazano Bridge, the single most dramatic event of the Bicentennial. The others along the crowded midway enjoyed all-American hot dogs, Colorado's own Coors beer. The celebration has been underway for about eight hours, and almost a million people have gathered at the base of the Gateway Arch on the banks of the Mississippi. The people, the million of them that have gathered for the bicentennial, have gotten more than they ever expected. July 1976. While the United States was celebrating its bicentennial, one citizen was preparing for a more nefarious event. This is a police sketch of the suspect in one of the nastiest murder cases New York police have had come their way in a long time. The killer police are looking for is called the 44 caliber killer because of the weapon he has used. Son of Sam's year and a half reign of terror put fear in the hearts of New Yorkers. Nobody, not even police, knew anything about him. And that fear of the unknown forced people off the streets and chased them inside. But all of a sudden, Sam hit home in the neighborhoods, first Queens, then the Bronx, and then Brooklyn. Nobody knew where he would strike next. New Yorkers were overwhelmed by the fact that they had to consider Sam before leaving their homes. With Son of Sam free to prowl the city and kill at will, he created in New Yorkers a sense of feeling vulnerable. It began in the Bronx on July 29, 1976. It ended last night in Yonkers when police announced they had arrested the 44 caliber killer. Police transported David Berkowitz from headquarters to Brooklyn Central Booking after my sources say he confessed to being the 44 killer. After he told them he was a killing machine, ordered by a voice speaking through a neighbor's dog to carry out his bloody outrages against young pretty women. In the end, the 44 caliber killer would strike eight times, leaving six dead and spawning the largest manhunt in New York City's history before his capture. But even with the madman off the streets, more questions arose. Who was David Berkowitz? Why did he call himself the Son of Sam? And was killings part of a satanic cult? goes on in San Francisco for the man known as the Zodiac Killer. There could be a serial killer in Chicago. The Oakland County child killer. Phantom killer. Frankfurt slasher. Four children have now been murdered. Has killed five and says he's going to kill again. Fifteen brutally murdered young women. The pattern is the same. One by one. The death count started rising. A man in a mask robbed, tied, and stabbed them. Strength stuck in burlap bags. It is highly unlikely that these women were murdered by separate Man. Where will the killer strike next? The police can't answer who or why. That's the question that we'll never know. I don't want to live the rest of my life wondering if this person's going to be caught. I believe that there's someone out there that has knowledge. And he's probably still at large. This apartment complex in the Bronx is where baby Richard came to live with his newly adopted family shortly after his birth on June 1st, 1953. The product of an affair with a married man, the young baby is put up for adoption and taken in by Pearl and Nathan Berkowitz, two Jewish hardware store owners living in the Bronx. They renamed him to David Berkowitz. Living in the top corner apartment at Stratford and Watson Avenues, David would later state he enjoyed the views from his quarter window, watching the skyline and traffic below. But he was also a troubled boy, with a penchant for theft and arson. He had been lied to that his mother had died during childbirth, which he blamed on himself. Neighbors described him as difficult, spoiled, and a bully, reportedly even poisoning the family parakeet, which he felt was taking too much attention away from him. He adored his adopted mother Pearl, sometimes even pretending to be sick from school just to stay at home with her. But at the age of 14, he was shocked when she died from cancer the family choosing to hide her battle with the disease from him. In 1967, he moved with his father and his new stepmother to this apartment complex in the co-op city neighborhood of the borough. But the teenager did not get along with the father's new wife, and four years later, he would join the army, serving overseas for three years before an honorable discharge and returning here for just a short time before deciding to move out on his own in 1974. 
It was during this time that David managed to track down his birth mother, Elizabeth Broder, who told him the details of his birth. Upset that she remained distant and angered that she had kept his half-sister but not him, David found his sense of identity shattered and a growing hatred for women. During his military service, he had caught a venereal disease when losing his virginity to a sex worker. He would resume committing arson, logging a series of 1,488 fires in a notebook he kept. In the summer of 1975, David enrolled in the Bronx Community College, but would drop out after a year. That December, however, he would graduate to violent crime. It was Christmas Eve 1975 when Berkowitz returned to Co-op City with a hunting knife and a lust for blood. Walking the streets, he first slashed at a Hispanic woman exiting a grocery store, but she screamed and he ran north to this chain-link fence below the pedestrian overpass of the New England Thruway. While catching his breath, he watched 15-year-old Michelle Foreman walking up and onto the bridge. As she was crossing, she was unaware that Berkowitz had begun to follow behind, until he rushed up and stabbed her six times. Thankfully, due to her thick winter coat, Michelle survived the attack and managed to stagger back to her family apartment, but could not identify her attacker. Shortly after, David's adoptive parents decided to move to Florida, and he would begin renting a house in Yonkers. The owner of the home had a German Shepherd who would frequently howl and set the neighborhood dogs off. This caused David to begin losing sleep, and he began envisioning that demons were inside the dogs. Just three months later, he found a home nearby and moved into another top corner apartment at what was then the Pine Hill Towers. Originally 35 Pine Street, after his later arrest, the owners had the address changed to try and distance themselves from the killer. Angered at his failed attacks, Berkowitz would ask an old army friend to purchase him a gun for protection during his drive back to New York from Texas, where he was visiting in June 1976. Police say the gun used in the killings came from this pawn shop in Houston. It was bought last year by a local construction worker, Billy Dan Parker, a close friend of David Berkowitz. July 29, 1976. 18-year-old Donna Loria and her friend 19-year-old Jody Valente pulled in front of Laria's family's apartment at the Beer Arms in the Bronx after a night at the disco. They would sit double parked in front of the building's main entrance while they had chatted for a while. Donna's parents also arrived home shortly after and joked with the two girls that they had an early night before heading inside and leaving them to finish talking. Around 1.10 a.m., Donna said her goodbyes and opened the door to see a man with a paper bag quickly approaching. She barely had time to question him when he pulled a revolver from it and fired between three and five rounds according to various articles. Jody would be hit in the thigh while Donna was struck in her neck. She was dead before she hit the pavement. Donna's father had heard the gunfire as he was coming down the stairs to let his daughter's poodle out. As he rushed out the door, he saw Donna dead and Jody screaming. The killer had fled immediately after firing. Here, in front of 2860 Buer Avenue in the Baychester section of the Bronx, 18-year-old Donna Laurie was sitting in a car with her friend Jody Valenti in front of Donna's house. Two shots blasted through the car window. Donna was killed instantly. My wife comes screaming in the hall. They were shot. I ran down. By the time I got down, she was dead in the street. And that was it. There was nobody around. Police believed the crime to be a mob hit gone wrong, and little press would be given to the attack. The same went for the next crime. It was 1.30 a.m. October 23rd that year when 18-year-old Rosemary Keenan parked her red Volkswagen Beetle near the corner of 159th Street and 33rd Avenue just a block away from Bone Park in Queens to smoke some weed with her on-and-off boyfriend, 20-year-old Carl DeNaro. The pair had just come from the bars, where they were celebrating Carl's joining the Air Force. 
Around 30 minutes later, someone walked up to the passenger side window and fired five shots inside. Because of the recoil, only one would hit Carl in his head, while Rosemary was unharmed and sped off to safety. Neither had a chance to see the shooter, and the 44 caliber bullets were too damaged that they were unable to be linked to any specific gun. To police, this was just another shooting in Fear City. When it happened again a month later, many would think the same thing. It was just after 12.30 a.m. on November 27th when high school students Donna DeMassey and Joanne Lomino arrived back to Lomino family home on 262nd Street in Queens after seeing a movie in Manhattan. The pair sat on the front stoop to chat a bit before Donna was going to walk the block back to her home when a young man in an army jacket approached them and began asking for directions. Before he had even finished his sentence though, he pulled out a 44 caliber revolver and fired five shots. The front window would shatter. Donna was hit in the neck but survived, while Joanne would be left paralyzed from the waist down after a bullet damaged her spinal cord. A neighbor would report seeing a blonde man running from the street holding a pistol. It is a middle class neighborhood, quiet and family oriented. There's not much crime here, especially violent crime. And this happened late at night, right at the steps of the Lamina household, just as the girls were about to go inside. Two days after Thanksgiving, it was almost 1 a.m. Donna DeMassey and Joanne Lamino were standing on the stoop of Miss Lamino's home in Belrose. The killer began firing. He hit Donna DeMassey in the neck, Joanne Lamino in the back. Both survived. Joanne Lamino is paralyzed. I heard Joanne and Frank crying. So then me and my father got up and ran outside. And, uh... Like, we saw him all bleeding on the floor. Did you see anybody out here at all? No. I just heard the shots. January 30th, 1977. 26-year-old Christine Freund was on a date with her boyfriend, 30-year-old John Deal. The two had been dating for seven years and planned to become engaged on Valentine's Day that year. After seeing Rocky at the movies, they had gotten a bite to eat and planned to go dancing when they got into John's car that was parked just in front of the steps to the Long Island Railroad entrance at Station Square in Queens. As the car warmed up, they began to kiss for a few minutes, unaware that someone was approaching their car. Suddenly, the passenger window exploded inward and Christine slumped into John's arms, shot in the head and arm. Christine Froon, 26 years old, soon to be married, is dead today. Dead in a shooting that has no apparent motive. And dead, perhaps just because, by chance, her boyfriend, John Deal, had to park four blocks away from the movie theater they were visiting. As they both got into the car, all of a sudden, the, the right passenger side window caved and he heard three shots, and his girlfriend slumped. I revved the engine once or twice, and then uh, all of a sudden, there's a crash, and you know, I turned. And I seen Chris falling like this towards me, you know? And I grabbed, I started screaming, Chris, 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 you know? And then there was one more bang, you know? And, you know, I pulled it towards me. And, you know, I went down in my seat, like, you know, I went down, and I heard one more bang. John was hit several times as well, but his wounds were all superficial. After his screams went unanswered, he would drive the car forward to the intersection with Continental Avenue, where he would be spotted and help arrived. Christine would die four hours later in the hospital. Police recalled the previous three shootings and did look into them as connected, but as different eyewitness descriptions existed for all of the cases, they dismissed the possibility of a single shooter. This is the second time in the last few months that an incident like this has happened in Queens. Well, if there's any connection, we can't really say at this time. The police say this is a senseless killing. There is no suspect, certainly no motive. It was around 7.30 p.m. March 8, 1977, when 19-year-old Columbia University student Virginia Voskirikin was on her way back home. Though she was walking past the frying shooting that took place about five weeks earlier, it was only 7.30 p.m., and a volunteer patrol had begun walking the streets after that murder, making her feel safe enough to walk past Station Square and turn onto Dartmouth Street, just a quarter mile left to her walk. 
As she came up to this tree, just 210 feet from the last shooting, a man coming up the opposite way on the sidewalk pulled out a gun. Quickly thinking, Virginia raised her textbooks as a shield, but a single shot would pierce through them and enter her skull, killing her almost immediately. Shortly after, a man walking the sidewalk noticed a body and was going to attempt resuscitation when he observed blood pouring from her mouth and ran to get police. An elderly man who had heard the gunshot would report seeing a pudgy young male running away. Every night coming home from school, it was an easy passage for Virginia Roscoreshin. Leaving the subway two blocks back, she would come down here to Dartworth Street, turn right, and would then have to walk approximately two blocks more to Essex, where she would turn left and into her door. But last night, she only got this far. It was pitch dark, and I saw a number of people standing around, and then noticed a body on the uh, ground, motionless. Beautiful young girl. It, was, it just really broke it down. 19 year old student at Columbia University, Virginia, Voskarichian, killed while walking home. Suddenly, a shot was fired at point blank range. Virginia Voskarichian fell to the pavement with blood spurting from a face wound. They killed a girl again. How do you I never hear those things? What happened now? What's changed? She was coming from the school, from college. Okay, this, this is it. We need protection. We are paying taxes and plenty. Okay. This is supposed to be a very quiet, low crime area. I, th I thought so too. It's really a lovely area to live and I enjoy it here. I like the area, but when two incidents like this happen... And two incidents? Well, the other shooting that happened over here a month ago, just, you know, right around the corner from here. Finally, police stated that the three murders were linked, causing a news frenzy. We have determined that there has been a 44 caliber revolver used in every one of them, which is why, as the mayor mentioned, it's important that any person having information with respect to anyone who's in possession of a 44 caliber revolver call us. In each case, the killer used a gun similar to this, a modern version of the old 44 caliber pistol used in the days of the Wild West. It was around 3 a.m. April 17th when 20-year-old Alexander Esau parked here off the service road of Hutchinson River Parkway, just a short way from his girlfriend's home, 18-year-old Valentina Suriani. This quiet and dark road had a reputation as a lover's lane and was just a few blocks northwest from where Donna Lauria had been killed the summer prior. The two university students had been out to see a movie and were sitting in the car when someone approached and fired four shots at them. Valentina died at the scene from a single shot. Alexander was shot twice in the head, but would linger on at the hospital unconscious for 18 hours before dying. His kidneys and corneas donated for transplant. Early yesterday, the killer struck again, returning here to the Bronx two blocks from his first attack. 18-year-old Valentina Suriani and her steady boyfriend, 20-year-old Alexander Esau, were parked in his car on the Hutchinson River Parkway service road. At 3 a.m., three shots tore through the side window of the car. Valentina died, a bullet wound in the head. Alexander was hit twice in the head. He died at 9 o'clock last night. This was also the first crime scene that the killer gave himself a name. The son of Sam. Found on the ground beside the car was a four-page handwritten letter addressed to police captain Joseph Borelli. I am deeply hurt by your calling me a woman hater. I am not. I am a monster. I am the son of Sam. I am a little brat. When Father Sam gets drunk, he gets mean. He beats his family sometimes. He ties me up to the back of the house. Other times, he locks me in the garage. Sam loves to drink blood, go out and kill the man's father. Sam behind our house, some rest mostly young, great and slaughtered their blood drained just bones now. Papa Sam keeps me locked in the attic. I can't get out, but I look out the attic window and watch the world go by. I feel like an outsider. I am on a different 
sketch of a suspect in one of the nastiest murder cases New York police have had come their way in a long time. The killer police are looking for is called the 44 caliber killer because of the weapon he has used. In New York, the search continues for the 44 caliber killer who has come to be known as the son of Sam, the object of one of the biggest manhunts in this city's history. This is headquarters for one of the most intense manhunts in the history of New York, the search for the 44 caliber killer. Operating out of this office, over 50 of the city's best detectives pour over clues and run down leads. On the wall are snapshots of the victims, most of them pretty girls with long, dark hair. The one hard lead is the gun, a 44 caliber Bulldog model manufactured by the Charter Arms Company of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Police are trying to trace the ownership of every snub-nosed 44 in the country, an estimated 28,000 guns. The largest task force in police history went into high gear as the city went into high fear. What are your feelings this morning as you do come out, though, and you? We're afraid. We're afraid. Yeah, we're all afraid now. Very unique in this area. This has always been a very quiet But area. it can start any time, can it? In any area, right? That's the thing. By night, police saturate neighborhoods where the killer has struck. Disguised as regular neighborhood toughs, they cruise in unmarked cars and check people who are still out long after midnight. How you doing? The police officers? Nope. You have some ID, maybe? Yeah. It was another false alarm in a case that's produced hundreds of false alarms. But each has to be checked out in the hope that the 44 caliber killer can be stopped before he strikes again. Newspapers by now are awash in the 44 caliber killer news, calling him a number of things and speculating on his sanity. The New York Police Department's Dr. Harvey Schlossberg, one of the nation's better known criminal psychologists, believes the killer has sexual inadequacy. The original shootings become a kind of a uh, outlet for this built up sexual aggression where he mixes sex and aggression, they become unclear for him. Uh, and of course what develops afterwards is uh, uh, a kind of a secondary gain system where the killing uh, doesn't satisfy the sexual urge. Uh, he still feels uptight, but because of the publicity and the attention he's getting, he starts to thrive on this. And so eventually that takes over. The killing becomes one of kind of recognition, a crying out, hey, listen, I'm here, don't forget me. Four days after police released a psychological profile on the killer, Daily Times columnist Jimmy Breslin would receive the second Son of Sam letter. Hello from the gutters of NYC, which are filled with dog manure, vomit, stale wine, urine, and blood. Hello from the sewers of NYC, which swallow up these delicacies when they are washed away by the sweeper trucks. Hello from the cracks in the sidewalks of NYC and from the ants that dwell in these cracks and feed in the dry blood of the dead that has settled into the cracks. Tell me, Jim, what will you have for July 29? You can forget about me if you like, because I don't care for publicity. However, you must not forget Donna Loria and you can 
not let the people forget her either. She was a very, very sweet girl, but Sam's a thirsty lad, and he won't let me stop killing until he gets his fill of blood. Mr. Preslin, sir, don't think that because you haven't heard from me for a while that I went to sleep. No, rather, I am still here. Like a spirit roaming the night. Thirsty, hungry, seldom stopping to rest, anxious to please Sam. I love my work. Now, the void has been filled. Not knowing what the future holds, I shall say farewell and I will see you at the next job. Or should I say you will see my hand of work at the next job? Remember Miss Gloria, thank you. In their blood and from the gutter Sam's creation, there are some names to help you along. The Duke of Death. The Wicked Thing Whipper. The Twenty-Two Disciples of Hell. John Wayne is rapist and suffocator of young girls. Son of Sam. It's one of those crimes that's been visited upon man throughout the ages. A demented killer. You don't know how to stop him. Jimmy Breslin, then of the New York Daily News, wrote a column about the killer. The letter was very eerie. I mean, uh, you know, then you know that he, he read something that you wrote. Somewhere out there, he's reading again. Well, the 44 killer still is at large. John Keenan, who is the chief of New York City Police Detectives, how much closer are you to apprehending Son of Sam these days, or is he just totally an elusive character? He's still an elusive character, but in the sense that uh, we, uh, we have a, a large force of detectives doing an investigation on the case. It's after midnight last night. Police Sergeant Pete Dreyer and his partner Frank Farrell both in plain clothes, check out a man who was cruising through the neighborhood alone. The man leaves his car. The light reflects off a revolver on the man's hip. You got a permit? The man has a permit. He says he's an off-duty private detective. But Sergeant Dreyer has questions. You always uh, carry your gun off-duty? You don't happen to know anybody carrying a 44, do you? Hey. The man doesn't know anyone with a 44. He's free to go. <laughs> Other officers cruise the neighborhood in uniform. Part of a small army of police assigned to watch for the killer here in the Pelham Bay neighborhood where he struck twice and in other neighborhoods throughout the city. Neighbors here have also grouped together to ride the streets at night looking for the killer. Among those who patrol is Michael Loria, whose 18-year-old daughter was killed last summer in the gunman's first known attack. I want to see this guy caught. I figure if I'm out patrolling one night, I may spot him. I know what goes on in my heart. I know, what you, I know how I feel. How could I say it? I want this guy caught. Now, policemen Dreyer and Farrell are chasing a suspicious car. You know, if we're gonna get this guy, we gotta get the jump on every call. The speedometer hits 90. The neighborhood sleeps, unaware of the chase. But the man Dreyer and Farrell were chasing turns out to be nothing more than a speeder. You just managed to go through our homicide zone. We're working on that uh, 44 caliber thing. Another routine night is ending for police and angry neighbors throughout the city. And the killer is still at large. And uh, that's it for this evening. Good night for NBC News. On June 26th, Sam's promise came true. 17-year-old Judy Placido was out with friends at the former Elephas Disco in the Bayside area of Queens when a few men began to hassle her. After 20-year-old Sal Lupo came to her aid, the pair left together to share a cigarette in either his or a bouncer's car according to various reports that was parked under a tree about 300 feet behind the disco on 211th Street just before 3 a.m. As they sat inside the car, they even mentioned the recent killing spree when, just after 3 a.m., the passenger window exploded as three gunshots hit Sal in the arm and Judy would be hit in her temple, shoulder, and back of neck. 
Sal would run back down to the discotheque to get help, while Judy attempted to follow, but collapsed in the street. For almost a year, New York police have been looking for a murderer they call the 44 caliber killer. Overnight, he hit again, this time wounding a young couple parked in a car. Whoever he is, it was his seventh attack in 11 months. Police found a familiar pattern. This car parked early in the morning, not far from a night spot. A pretty girl with long, dark hair and her date, hit by 44 caliber bullets, fired without warning through a side window. Sal Lupo and Judith Placido both survived although one shot missed Miss Placido's spinal cord by two centimeters. Residents say they heard four shots ring out. Then Judy Placido left the car which had been parked by that tree and staggered up 211th Street here to 45th Road where she fell just about here. Police had reportedly been staking out the club but left to patrol another possible hotspot just minutes before the killer had struck. By now, it was noted that a million dollars had been spent on the Son of Sam case. New Yorkers were cautious, but many felt safe either by changing their hair or staying out of the areas Sam wandered. No one thought it would happen to them if they played it safe. Do you feel personally threatened by the 44 caliber killer because you have long dark hair? Yes, I do. <laughs> Has his existence in any way interfered with your movements at night? Yes, I stay in. You didn't stay in in the past? No. I don't feel free to go out, to walk the streets or go out at all. We used to stay in front of my house and park, you know, and kiss goodnight, but we can't do that no more. We just go right in. You have to be careful. You have to watch where you go now, you know, how late you stay out. And I'm afraid. I'm afraid to go out in the car. I'm afraid to do anything. You never know where he's going to be. No way would I sit in a parked car. Discotheques are losing business. Young people are afraid the killer may select his victims at these places. Residential areas all over New York are deserted after midnight now. Fear is spreading as the killer moves into different neighborhoods. By day, it's common to see young women with kerchiefs over their hair or hair pinned up because most of the victims had long hair. Did you ever think of cutting your hair because of him? And I thought of maybe dyeing it a little redder or something, really. What about your friends? Are they doing the same thing? Yes, <laughs> even when they don't have long hair. Yeah, same thing. It scares you. Do you have many customers who come in, women who want to get their hair shortened? Uh, yes, I do. They get their hair cut short, even though it's not so becoming on them. Would you tell me what has happened in this neighborhood since the killing by Son of Sam? What has happened? A lot of people want to kill him. A lot of people want to go out by themselves and kill him because they knew the girl, right? And uh, they want to go out, they want to kill him because he's a crazy guy, and I like to see him killed. But I'm not afraid, because I got a lot of people hanging out with me, see them all, get them all. <laughs> and we'll all attack him. That'll never, that'll and we'll never all play. attack him. Some of the uh, most well-meaning uh, citizens that you come across, I think if they got their hands on this guy, they'd be looking to string him right up on the spot. They're afraid. You never know when you turn around who's going to be there. Like my sister will not come out of the house now. It's just, it's just too dangerous. You can't take the chance. He's a sick guy. He'd kill any time. It could be anyone. Anybody that I speak to could be a potential killer or a potential maniac. He could be the guy around the corner from you, for all you know. The symbol only adds to the mystery of all this. So far, police say they're not even close to solving the case of the 44 caliber killer. Robert Hager, NBC News, New York. It was about 1.45 a.m. July 31st when 19-year-old Stacy Moskowitz and 20-year-old Robert Violante parked under this streetlight across the street from Bath Beach Park in Brooklyn and just before the Shore Parkway footbridge. Their first day had gone well, and they walked over to the park to swing on a swing set, which has been vastly redesigned in the past few years. As they swang, the happy pair noticed a hippie-type man hanging around the shadows of the public bathroom. Even though no attacks had occurred in Brooklyn, and all the previous victims were brunettes, unlike Stacy, who was a blonde, they decided to go back to Robert's car, just to be safe. Meanwhile, police were on full alert in Queens and the Bronx as the one-year anniversary of his first murder had occurred. 
The other boroughs were still playing it safe too, patrolling and kicking kids out of Lover's Lane such as Bath Beach, but they were also still handing out parking tickets. It was out front of 290 Bay 17th Street, just a block away from the park, that officers noticed a car had been parked in front of this fire hydrant for quite some time that night and wrote it a ticket. Less than 600 feet away, Stacy and Robert had forgotten about the weirdo at the bathhouse as they kissed and talked inside Robert's car. When around 2.35 a.m., that man approached the passenger side window and fired four shots into the couple's heads. A killer who has roamed the boroughs of New York for the past year struck again over the past weekend. He critically wounded a young couple as they sat in their automobile early Sunday in Brooklyn. The four shots went off and, it, and we knew it was shots, it just it had to be. And I said to my girlfriend, those were shots. And then this horn started beeping incessantly. And then it stopped and then it beeped again. And then this man started screaming, help me, God help me. And I ran and called the police and we saw this one cop car pull up. And we ran down the street, and the guy was against the fence, lay, well, slouched. And he was covered with blood. And the girl was covered with blood. It was a horror. Robert's eyes were shattered, and he was completely blinded as he felt Stacy slump into him. He managed to climb out of the car and hang against the lamppost while he held his hand against the horn, screaming for help. The pair would be rushed to the hospital in critical condition. What can you tell me about your son? <laughs> we brought him up the right way. Good boy, never any trouble. You told him to stay out of Queens. I told him to stay out of Queens. I still tell you, I left something very dear to me. Great kid. Robert would eventually recover, though he was left permanently blind in one eye. Stacy hung on for 38 hours before passing away. Sam's a thirsty lad, and he won't let me stop killing until he's had his full of blood. Well, early Sunday morning, just two days after the anniversary of his first cold-blooded murder, the man who calls himself the son of Sam kept his ghastly promise. In a neighborhood of the Bronx called Pelham Bay, and in Forest Hills near the famous tennis club, the killer has struck six times since last summer, and five are dead. Most of them pretty young women, shot at close range on the sidewalk or in parked cars. What's it going to take to break this? A lot of luck. We're going to have to be in the right place at the right time, the way I feel. Uh... But right now, there's really nothing to go on. Nothing. Yet again, police were left stumped until four days later, a witness came forward. She'd been walking her dog on Bay 17th shortly before the shooting when she noticed a man looking at a ticket on the car. He held something dark in his hand and glared at her until she went back to her apartment, hearing the shots shortly after. The man came towards me and he looked me straight in the face. He looked at my door and right here, we, we crossed each other. So he had his arms straight down. He had a long thing like a bell sticking up his sleeve. and. Uh, he made a left turn. I heard a boom. I didn't know he was a killer. I didn't know he looked nice. Police reviewed parking tickets, finding one belonging to a David Berkowitz from Yonkers, and asked local police to interview him. When the dispatcher taking the call heard the name, a red flag went up. Wee Carr told the detective she knew Berkowitz personally, and he had shot her father's dog, Harvey. Her father's name was Sam. David, who lived in the top apartment behind their house, had written threatening letters to the Carr family complaining how the dog tormented him at night. All the pieces began to fall into place. The Carrs lived off of Wicker Street. 
John Carr, one of the two real sons of Sam Carr, was nicknamed Wheaties, as his middle name was Wheat. The following day, August 10th, a police officer checked out Berkowitz's car, which was parked exactly here on Pine Street, just south of his apartment. Inside, he spotted a gun and ammunition in the back seat, along with a new son of Sam letter addressed to the task force and was to be left at the next murder. Police would stake out the car, waiting for Berkowitz to come out. Finally, at 10 p.m. that night, he did. Two officers came to both sides of the car and pointed their guns at his head, telling him not to move. He simply looked at them and said either, you got me, or what took you so long? I don't recall exactly what he said, but uh, he said, Inspector, and uh, uh, then he said uh, something to the effect that it was the end of the line. Did he seem pleased that it was the end of the line, Inspector Dow? Uh, it was difficult for me to judge, but he smiled slightly. He didn't seem uh, greatly perturbed, and I just couldn't make a judgment. Thursday, August 11th, 1977. The long search for Son of Sam may be over. A 24-year-old Yonkers man is under arrest for the murder of Stacy Moskowitz and the attempted murder of Robert Violenta. He will be taken into custody where he confessed to all the shootings along with his previous two knife attacks at the behest of Sam Carr through his dog which was possessed by an ancient demon. And I had nothing against these victims. Who were these people to me? They were just people. I, I didn't hate them. I wasn't angry against them. So where did they do it? Well, Sam did it through me. He used me. He made me go out there and do it. He, I did it for him, for blood. The uh, ballistics section has just called and told us that the uh, 44 caliber gun recovered tonight has been tested and the bullets match the bullets recovered from Stacy Moskowitz. He would be promptly sent to Kings County Hospital to undergo psychiatric treatment. Well, tell me more about this Sam. Sam is a dog? Yeah, Sam's a dog. The dog tells, I, I understand the dog and he can do he can do everything and he makes, he commands me to do things. Well, That's what they told me. What, what I heard was just slightly different was that Sam is a, is a 6,000 year old something who's almost human and he talks to him through his dog. It's mm -hmm. Sam's dog that tells him what Sam wants. And he, but, but he tells you all of this in a very rational, straightforward tone, like, you know, yesterday I went to the grocery and I got three boxes of uh, whatever. Oh, well, this they, was some piece of work you walk in the streets here. When well, they arrested him, not only did he have the submachine gun in the car and the 44 caliber revolver, but he also had another poem that he had written, mm. which was going to be left for the Suffolk Police Department, Suffolk, Suffolk County, County where, where the Hamptons, where he was going to strike it. And the, the poem said, because Craig is Craig, so must the streets be filled with Craig. And then after Craig, in parentheses, it said death. Craig meaning death. And then it went on to say, and big drops of lead poured down on her head till she was dead. Yet the cats still come out to mate, and the sparrows still sing in the morning. And, and, and Craig is a man who lives in the same building with him, who's a deputy sheriff, and a man with whom he had been feuding. Inside of Berkowitz's apartment was exactly what you would expect a serial killer's lair to look like. Furniture was sparse. Trash littered the floor. Bizarre writing covered the walls, much of which was dedicated to Sam. It was well after 3 o'clock when New York City police walked out with what they would only describe as ballistics evidence. Among other things, they had found a 44 caliber revolver, a 45 caliber machine gun, a rifle, and newspaper clippings of the son of Sam murders. Police said the articles found inside Berkowitz's apartment included a sleeping bag, the only furniture, some unframed art reproductions taped to the wall, and a scrapbook of son of Sam newspaper clippings. Here in the studio tonight is Teresa Graziano, who worked with David Berkowitz and at times ate lunch with him. Teresa, can you give me some idea of what he was like? Well, to me, he seems like a very average young man. He was a good worker. He was quiet spoken. He was a little bit on the shy side, but in all ways, I would say he was very, very normal. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised at all that he is the suspected son of Sam? I was very, very surprised. What kind of man was Mr. Berkowitz? Uh, Mr. Berkowitz was a uh, 
more or less of a quiet, reserved uh, person. He seemed to be a good worker, did his job well. I was shocked. I, I couldn't believe it. I still, like, I still don't believe it, you know, it's because he was such a quiet guy. And He served here three years as a volunteer without incident? No problems at all. No, no problems in his record at all. 35 Pine Street in Yonkers, a nice building in a nice neighborhood. Apartment 7E was home to David Berkowitz. No one here really knew him, although almost everyone knew who he was. A white man living in a mostly black building. Quiet, perhaps a little strange, but certainly not murderous. You saw him? You knew him? Yes, he was nice. He was a nice man. He always said hello and how were you doing and everything. I would never think that he was son of Sam. It's just an eerie feeling to have lived next door to someone and not have known. Well, it's a frightening feeling, you know, knowing that he was here, you know, but, you know. I never saw him, you know, coming in and out of the apartment. I didn't know it was him until after I saw it on TV this morning, you know, his face. In general, his neighbors describe him as basically nice, quiet, kept to himself, perhaps a little strange, perhaps a little moody. Son of Sam killed six and wounded seven. How many people do you know, your neighbors, people who might fit that description? The Carr family found themselves the new target of speculation and had people wondering, did they participate in the murders? Sam Carr, who lives in this house on Wicker Street, who received threatening letters from the suspect and who is certain that Berkowitz tried to kill his dog with a 44 caliber gun. The suspect only wounded the Labrador but with his seeming obsession with dogs, it seems obvious that by mentioning the King of Wicker in one of his letters, he meant Sam Carr, who lived on Wicker Street, and police believe that is why the suspect started calling himself Son of Sam, after okay, Sam like Carr, you, who owned a beautiful Labrador, a beautiful dog, and who the suspect may have seen as the perfect father figure. David stated that they all were part of a satanic cult, and tunnels under the car home led to Untermeyer Park, where the ceremonies were held. Though it has been cleaned up and restored in recent years, back in the 70s, Untermeyer was largely overgrown and full of ruins. Next-door hospital workers would regularly report that they saw torch flames deep in the woods along with chanting. Rumors that underneath the Temple of the Sky there is a secret hollow space for occult ceremonies. In 1976, police did report they found carefully mutilated remains of German shepherds discarded in the southern aqueduct of the park. It's also worth noting that police took a report of three dog carcasses found and buried by boys in Berkowitz's neighborhood, a mile and a half south of the park. The aqueduct trail is referred to as Gutter's Path, or the sewers, by locals. The old pump house was referred to as the Devil's Cave, and in his investigation on the subject, Maury Terry stated he found satanic graffiti on the walls inside, leading him to his lifelong obsession that Berkowitz did not act alone. Michael and John Carr would both die within a year of Berkowitz's arrest, and he claimed they, along with numerous other cult members, had taken part in the shootings, though he continues to maintain he deserves lifelong imprisonment for his role. Renaming himself to the Son of Hope in the late 80s, Berkowitz has published several evangelical books, though he makes no money off of their sale, thanks to the Son of Sam law that was created as many feared he would sell his story when arrested. The Son of Sam could make millions selling his story, so the law was passed to take that money from criminals like Berkowitz and give it to their victims. And several of his victims have successfully sued for their share of $100,000 in profits. Most of the survivors have chosen to stay out of the press since their attacks. Jody Valenti would live with PTSD for a long time, stating it took her six years before she could enter a car at night. Rosemary Keenan has never appeared in the press after her incident. Carl DeNaro, on the other hand, would work in telecommunications financing for Merrill Lynch. After retiring, he would release a book in 2021 where he presented his theories of multiple shooters and satanic cults in the case. 
Joey and Lomino had been saving up money to move out of her own home before the shooting left her a paraplegic. John Deal turned to alcohol after his fiancée's death and was last noted as having issues with his workplace. Judy Placido would break her silence following Spike Lee's 1999 film, Summer of Sam, and shared she still feels panic whenever she found herself alone and that she begged the director not to make the film. Sal Lupo would never reappear in the news after his hospital release. Robert Violante would eventually recover from his blindness and work 35 years as a mail carrier for the United States Postal Service. In later interviews, he reveals he never married and always wondered what his relationship with Stacey Moskowitz would have blossomed into. To this day, it is still debated if David Berkowitz acted alone. His case was reopened in 1996, but had no conclusive findings. Did any more Sons of Sam roam the streets of New York during the Year of Terror? Or was a single killer correctly apprehended and locked up? At 70 years old, Berkowitz has parole hearings every two years, his latest May 2024. As the years wear on, fewer and fewer remain to remember his haunting words. But were they an epitaph or a prophecy? It's all over, how do you feel? Oh. Fantastic. We're so relieved because we've been so, oh, worried over here. We were afraid to go down the block. Our children were afraid to play in the park. Praise the Lord. No, we're happy. It's over. Yeah. We're very, very happy. It's a sin that they had to take them alive. I still feel a lot of grief in me for the people that had to get hurt. But as long as it's over. I was getting a little worried since I have short length brown hair and everything, but now I'm much better. Oh, I feel much safer walking the streets of New York. <laughs> much safer, you know, I can go out at night and go to the discotheques and just feel better about it. I don't have to worry. This guy deserves to die. It's just the way I feel. My daughter was 18 years old, and that's what he took out of my heart, 18 years. I feel very... Very good about it that uh, everybody can go out with their dates safe again now. You know, some of us had to suffer through this. It's a very difficult thing to resume anything normal afterward, as far as I'm concerned anyway. You just can't pick up uh, nothing pieces when there's no pieces to pick up.